I'm just about to go and give a speech about workers' rights, environment issues and security of ordinary people all across Europe. It's going to be interesting. That do? Are you still following? Okay. <laughs>
of the beaches of this country were too dirty to swim from. Now, 95% of our beaches have a clean bill of health because of tough regulations that help not just people in this country, but people all over Europe, because clearly sewage pumped into the sea here can end up in France or Holland, and vice versa. Three years ago, the European Union voted to restrict the use of some pesticides that are strongly linked to a decline in the bee population. A bee population is absolutely essential for our biodiversity. The coalition government, led by the Tories, lobbied against these restrictions. Thankfully, these restrictions were passed, and I hope are going to be tough. It's going to be tough implementation of them to ensure a regeneration of the bee population and, of course, the, uh, the biodiversity that goes with it. Too often, the British government has had to be dragged kicking and screaming in order to protect our own environment. The Prime Minister has lurched from his hugger husky phase when he became Tory leader, a decade on to gassing badgers, and then later on to trying to poison bees. I think he needs to take some <laughs> eco lessons uh, and biodiversity. <laughs> and, uh, understanding the necessity and the beauty of our natural environment. A recent court judgment ordered the British government to do more to tackle air pollution. And it was the UK Supreme Court in London which acted to enforce EU standards. A recent study found that EU air quality regulations are saving roughly 80,000 lives per year across the whole continent. It's time this government acted to save lives here too. The air quality in London is poor, it's poor in other cities. It has to be improved. We can use EU legislation to improve it. European Union targets have been <clears throat> vital in encouraging the adoption of renewable energy. Some countries, like Germany and Denmark, have embraced this change, invested and revolutionised their energy markets, creating new, high-skilled jobs and leading technological advance. Britain has dragged its heels. So much for David Cameron's rhetoric about leading the greenest government ever. There are other things as well. It's an EU directive that stopped the mobile phone companies from ripping us off if we make or receive a call anywhere in Europe. It was the collective strength of 28 countries representing 520 million people that achieved that. A crucial area is the European Convention on Human Rights that empowers citizens to hold the government to account. This has strengthened our rights as citizens and stopped our government from gagging free speech and the free press. It was the Labour government which uh, wrote the convention into UK law through the very important and seminal Human Rights Act of 1998. Today, senior figures in the Conservative government are discussing repealing the Act which has ensured the state cannot violate people's rights. It's because of those human rights in law that we actually achieved the inquest into Hillsborough so that those families finally got justice after 27 years of hard work and campaigning to get a hearing. And congratulations to them. and the dignity that they can, with which they conduct themselves over all those very long, very difficult years. It's worth reflecting that if this government repealed the Human Rights Act and opted out of the European Convention on Human Rights, it would join Britain's, uh, Europe's only dictatorship, Belarus, as the only other country not to support universal human rights. A Labour government will restore our human rights in full if they've managed to repeal the Human Rights Act. On rights at work, this is a very, very important area. Europe, through the social chapter and other directives, has delivered a number of good things. 26 million workers in Britain benefit from being entitled to 28 days of paid leave per year, and a limit on how many hours they can be forced to work through the Working Time Directive. Over 8 million part-time workers, 6 million of whom are women, 
have equal rights with full-time colleagues. One million temporary workers have the same rights as permanent workers. 340,000 women every year have guaranteed rights to take maternity leave. It's important to understand these gains. It means workers throughout Europe have decent rights at work. It means it's harder to undercut terms and conditions across Europe. And I pay tribute to unions all across Europe, as well as in Britain, that have forced these regulations through and continue to campaign to strengthen them even further. stated clearly they want to leave Europe to water down workers' rights, to rip up the protections that protect work-life balance, that prevent discrimination and prevent exploitation and injustice. That is why we say the threat to the British people is not the European Union. It's a Conservative government here in Britain seeking to undermine many of the good things that unions and other people have achieved in Europe and resisting changes that would benefit ordinary people in this country. A vote to leave means the Conservative government would then be in charge of negotiating Britain's exit. Everything they've done as a government so far means we could not rely on them to protect working place, workplace rights that millions of people rely on. A Tory Brexit negotiation would be a disaster for the majority of people in Britain who rely on many of these regulations to protect their environment, their consumer rights and their conditions of work. But that is not to say there isn't a case for reform. Because none of us are satisfied with the European Union as it is. We believe Europe can and must do far more to meet the needs of our people. That's why we make the case to remain. We also make the Labour case for reform. A Labour government will protect the gains that have benefited our people while energetically pushing for progressive reform in Europe. In alliance with our allies across the continent, a vision of Europe of cooperation and solidarity. We can <laughs> reform to get a better deal for consumers, to strengthen workers' rights across Europe and prevent the undercutting of wages, to meet the challenges posed by migration and the refugee crisis. There has to be a humanitarian approach to the refugee crisis, not a And also to end the pressure to privatise our public services, to bring greater democracy to the European Union's institutions, and to bring them closer to people, and for reforms that generate prosperity across Europe for the benefit of all. Many people will be taking a European holiday in the coming months. They'll be benefiting from lower airfares and cheaper roaming charges on their mobile phones. But there are other areas where, working with our political allies in Europe and the 27 other countries representing over 450 million people, we can use our collective negotiating power to stop corporations taking consumers to the pits. <laughs> raised with the Prime Minister, and I'll be raising it with him continuously until he agrees, the need to reform, you'd be, you'd be surprised how determined I can be, <laughs> the need to reform the posting of workers directive. This would close the loophole that allows workers from one country to work in another and be paid less than the local workers doing exactly the same job. The government must sign that. Instances are actually relatively few, but 
such incidents undermine community cohesion by exploiting migrant workers and undercutting local workers and creating awful local tensions. This loophole only benefits unscrupulous employers seeking to drive down wages. pressing the UK government to back the proposals that are on the table to close the loophole. It's not migrants that undercut wages, but unscrupulous employers that do so. Yes. Migrant workers. <laughs> migrant workers are often victims of the worst exploitation. It's our duty to close loopholes and strengthen an enforcement of employment protection here in Britain and across Europe, and we will do that. A couple of months ago, I had uh, talks with the Greek Prime Minister, Alexis Tsipras, who was elected on a clear anti-austerity platform to resolve his country's financial crisis. The way in which Greece has been treated by its creditors, including the European Central Bank, shows that Europe has to develop fairer and more effective mechanisms to manage such crises in the future. No one benefits from enforcing unpayable debt with yet more destructive austerity and the ties of solidarity undermined by such counterproductive action. Although Greece has suffered from enforced austerity, the Greek president and the Greek people are clear they want to stay within a reformed European Union. That was the basis of the discussions I had with Alexis and other ministers in the Greek government. There must be a Europe that works together to develop a strategy for renewed and shared growth and for the gains of that growth to be shared more equally. Thousands of people have written to me with concerns, deep concerns, about the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Mm -hmm. The deal being negotiated largely in secret between the US and EU officials. Many are concerned, quite rightly, that it could open up public services to further privatisation and make privatisation effectively irreversible. Others are concerned about potential watering down of consumer rights, food safety standards, rights at work or environmental protections. And a facility for corporations to take national governments to court if regulations impinge on their profits. I've read a great deal about this, I've thought a great deal about it, and I absolutely share all of those concerns that have been expressed by the President. President Francois Hollande said that he would veto the deal as it stands, and to become law, any deal would have to be ratified by each member state. So today, we give this pledge. As it stands, we too would reject TTIP and veto it in the are good enough for other people, it's not good enough for us either. Let's be clear about that. David Cameron makes clear, now that Britain votes to remain this month, I ask him, will you block any TTIP trade to treaty that threatens our public services, our consumer rights and our employment gains, or that has power over to giant corporations to override democratically elected governments? The issue of the power of global corporations over democratic government is a huge one. TTIP is at the very epicenter of that debate. That is why I take such a strong line on TTIP, to assert the democratic rights of people to elect their governments in order to act to defend them against the power of to win those arguments, not isolated. limit the scope for governments to intervene, support our vital industries, also need to change. 
but so does how British governments interpret them. The steel crisis highlighted how Germany, Italy, France and Spain all did much better at protecting their steel industries. They acted within EU state aid rules to support their industries, whether through taking a public stake, investing in research and development, providing loan guarantees or compensating for energy costs. Nevertheless, I still think the rules are too restrictive and that national governments must have the powers to act to protect key industries like the steel industry. And we look forward to the British government acting rapidly to ensure that Port Talbot is protected uh, in the difficult days that all the workers and unions at Port Talbot are facing at the present time. We're committed to bringing railways into public ownership and that is the democratic will of the public and the democratic will of our party. That's why our members of the European Parliament are scrutinising the fourth rail package currently being negotiated in the European Parliament to ensure there is no obstacle to a fully, uh, fully socially owned rail network in Britain. That's what we want to achieve, and that's what we intend to achieve. More widely, we need to reform in Europe to ensure that we put a stop to the drive to privatise and break up our public services and utilities. The experience of Britain's many failed privatisations and the damage done by the outsourcing of our public services is an object lesson into why the pressure to continue this three decades old experiment be brought to an end here and across Europe. Privatisation and uh, agency working are the bedevilment of much of local government and of our health service. We want the right to national government. services for the people that absolutely need them. When it comes to the refugee crisis, many European countries have made great efforts in response, whether taking large numbers of people fleeing persecution or funding refugee camps in Lebanon and Turkey, as Britain has done. But collectively, as a continent, we have to be honest about it, we've failed to coordinate our efforts properly. Failed those countries like Greece and Italy that have seen desperate people land on their shores in unprecedented numbers. And tragically, we have failed people who desperately need and deserve our help. These are human beings, just like everyone of us in this room, trying to survive in a difficult and dangerous world. Let us extend the hand of humanity to them. <laughs> must never be allowed to happen again. And that in future, we coordinate our efforts as a continent, across the whole continent. On migration into every country, we cannot deny the inevitable. We live in a smaller world. Most of us in Britain know someone who studied, worked, or retired abroad. We have reciprocal arrangements with the European Union. Our citizens, well over a million of them, live in other European Union countries. And EU citizens come to live and work here. But it's not that simple. I've already talked about how some industries are affected by the undercutting of wages and that action can be taken to tackle that. But some communities can change dramatically and rapidly and that can be disconcerting for some people. That doesn't make all of them Little England and xenophobes or racists. More people living in an area can put real pressure on local services like doctors, schools and housing. That is not the fault of the migrants, it's a failure of government. the Migrant Impact Fund, a national fund to manage the short-term impacts of migration on local communities. By abolishing it, David Cameron's then coalition government undermined the proper preparation and investment that communities need to adapt. We're clear. 
we would restore such a fund. And it could be managed through a combination of using EU underspend and reprioritizing <coughs> money from outdated existing European Union schemes. We cannot and should not want to close the borders, not for European citizens wanting to come here, tens of thousands of whom work in our National Health Service, and not for British citizens who want to take advantage of opportunities to study and work elsewhere in Europe. public services are able to sustain the communities we have here. Part of that is through the Migrant Impact Fund. And partly too, it's about reversing the damaging, unnecessary austerity policies that this government continues to impose on our communities and the people of this country. <laughs> we, the Labour Party, are overwhelmingly for staying in. Because we believe the European Union has brought investment, jobs and protection for workers, consumers and the environment. But also because we recognise that our membership offers a crucial role to meeting the challenges that we all face in the 21st century. Climate change, restraining the power of global corporation and ensuring they pay fair taxes both in Europe and chase down the tax havens all around the world. Also, and tackling cybercrime and terrorism, and ensuring trade is fair with protections for workers and consumers and in addressing refugee movements. Britain will be stronger if we cooperate with our neighbours in facing these challenges together. Europe absolutely needs to change. I've outlined some areas for progressive reform, but these changes can only be achieved by working with our allies. There is an overwhelming case to remain and reform so that we build on the best that Europe has achieved. But that will only happen if we elect a Labour government in Britain committed to engaging with our allies, to deliver real improvements to the lives of the people of our country. That's why we established the Labour in campaign because we have a distinct agenda. A vision to make Britain better and fairer for everyone by engaging with our neighbours. So when you vote on the 23rd of June, I hope you vote to remain, and then campaign with us on solidarity and changes that we need all across this continent. We can and will make big changes. That is what the Labour Party is all about. Thank you very much. Now taking questions from the floor. Let's listen in. On Sunday, I'm going to Bournemouth. There were no no-go areas for our party in our campaign. And yes. Yes, we will. Yes, we're, we're getting that message out, and obviously the nearer you get to the referendum, there's going to be more intensity in the public debate and public discussion. I don't think anyone's going to be in any doubt as to what our views are come the vote on the 23rd of June. Okay? That's Maura Cohen from Sky. Tamara Cohen, Sky News. Mr Corbyn, you and David Cameron are on the same side in this referendum. Do you think attacking the Treasury forecast about Brexit as hysterical hype is, is muddying the waters for many Labour supporters? No, I don't think it is at all. It's pointing out that there's a distinctive view we take. We obviously disagree with the economic strategy being pursued by this government. This is a serious issue, it's a serious debate, and that's how we intend to pursue it. So uh, we are putting the case, which I've put this morning, is being put every day by Labour Party members and supporters all over the country. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Laura Coonsberg from the BBC. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Mr Corbyn, you very clearly acknowledged this morning that immigration can put real pressure on public services and communities in this country. For Labour voters, what do you think is more important, defending workers' rights, as you've talked about this morning, or 
immigration and the impact on communities in this country. And this morning, one of your biggest supporters, the leader of the GMB, has told the BBC that Labour has failed to get its message across. Is he right? Uh, I'm looking forward to speaking to the GMB on Sunday in Bournemouth, and obviously I know Tim very well and very happy to work with him. We are getting our message out as loudly as we can. All of the unions that have supported this campaign, and that is the vast majority of unions, both affiliated to the Labour Party and the TUC, are getting that message out through workplace campaigning and through all their membership networks. So I think the message will be very, very clear that uh, we are campaigning to defend and extend workers' rights and trade union rights in Britain, as we would across Europe, that's why we're working with others, and also pointing out that it's the British government's economic austerity problems that are causing many of the difficulties in many communities. And I pointed out that the Migrant Impact Fund could be and should be utilised in order to um, deal, deal with those kind of issues. But let's not turn this into blaming people who travel, work and migrate around Europe. Let's instead ensure governments respond to the needs of all communities and that unscrupulous employers that are grossly exploiting migrant workers and trying to limit their rights need to, uh, need to be dealt with. And that's why I'm very keen on the posting of workers directive loophole must be closed as quickly as possible. I've asked the Prime Minister this several times. We're going to keep on about this because it's very, very important for working conditions, not just in this country, but for those of migrant workers that travel across Europe for work. And let's face it, many of our public services rely on those that have come to live in this country. Our health service, our education service, much of our transport service, many of our engineering industries, and indeed much of our research. We actually achieve things when you utilize the skills of everybody. That's, what, uh, that's why we're campaigning on the issues that we are of the need to remain and reform within the European Union. We heard Jeremy Corbyn's speech a little earlier, and when it comes to reasons for the UK to stay in the European Union, you wouldn't necessarily put the safety of bees, bees, at the top of the list. Uh, Mr Corbyn has been setting out his reasons why bees will be safer if Britain remains part of the European Union. Let's talk to our political guru, Norman Smith, who was watching and listening, as we all were. Well, that was interesting, environmental reasons, bees and beaches. Mick, I've heard all sorts of arguments for staying in the EU, but I've never heard the one that says bees will be better off. But that was uh, part of Mr Corbyn's argument today. Of course, he's a keen uh, gardener, got his own allotment, so it's an issue which he probably feels quite strongly about. But he said the EU had passed a directive to safeguard bees and the Conservative government had voted against it. He also suggested there were EU regulations on pesticides uh, which benefited bees. And if bees wasn't enough, he also said the EU was better for beaches. So beaches and bees would both benefit if we stayed in the EU. Now that's perhaps being a little bit flippant because he was making, you know, a much bigger pitch about the EU and why Labour people should be in favour of it. Primarily it has to be said about workers' rights and employment rights and uh, he talked about trying to extend those. He was saying, okay, Europe does a lot but it can do more. And some of the areas which he said a Labour government would seek to address, he suggested, for example, that if the Conservatives abolished the Human Rights Act, Labour would immediately seek to reinstate that. If they signed up to this controversial transatlantic trade deal, Labour would veto that. So we did get a little bit of grit from Mr Corbyn, but I think quite a few eyebrows were probably raised at the thought that bees and beaches were the biggest issues.